Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. If you like this podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you take just a few minutes and leave a review for me on iTunes. It is super easy to do, and it makes the podcast easier for other people to find. Plus, it helps me get so many of these great guests that you hear on the show. So all you need to do is go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash review. That page has a direct link to iTunes where you can leave your review. It would mean so much to me, and I thank you in advance for that. The Savvy Painter podcast is published every week on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, and SoundCloud. If you are a painter or artist who is looking for down-to-earth, real-life conversations about art, how to create it, how to sell it, you are in the right place. Savvy Painter has been downloaded over a million times by artists in 150 countries. This is the place where you will find your community, you will be inspired to create, and you'll hear real stories from artists who are thriving with their art. So if you are new to this podcast, I want to welcome you to the Savvy Painter community. But make sure you don't miss an episode. Sign up for weekly updates, free guides, and workshop announcements. Go to SavvyPainter.com and click on Join. It's that easy. Now let's get started. My guest this week is Asan Maleki. And just sort of as a pre-warning, with this interview, you get sort of a behind-the-scenes glimpse into how I conduct interviews. I usually spend the first five or ten minutes just chit-chatting with my guests before I start the interview. This allows me to get a feel for the sound quality or any issues with the connection, but more importantly, most importantly, it allows us both to relax into a more natural conversation. But in this case, I became so interested in the conversation that I never formally started the interview. We just kept talking. So I chose not to disrupt the flow and just go with it. Now, Asan and I had been trying to connect for a while. We had a date set up a few months ago, and he needed to reschedule at the last second for the best possible reason. His wife had just given birth to their first child, a little boy named Samyar. And if you listen very closely at the very, very end of the interview, you will hear little Samyar wake up. Hassan Maleki is an artist living in Tehran, Iran. He was born and raised in the old city of Esfahan, where he received his classical art training at the School of Fine Arts. In this episode, Hassan and I talk about the type of art created in Iran. Much of it might be familiar to you, except maybe the Iranian miniature art. Hassan describes Iranian miniatures, why they are so important to his culture, and talks about a modern master of Iranian miniature art, who Hassan was fortunate enough to study with at university. Hassan has chosen to paint in the traditional Western style. His work depicts the everyday life of people around him, municipal workers in the streets, and everyday moments in the city. We have a fascinating conversation about art movements and culture, which frames the way that we interpret both art and everyday life. And I have to say that I really, really enjoyed this conversation so much because I love conversations that leave me thinking differently. And this one with Asan was definitely one of those. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Asan Maleki. How's the new baby? He's doing well. Yeah, he's uh, going up so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> How many months is he now? He's two months old. That must be so exciting for you. This is your first your first child, right? Yes, he's sleeping now, and I hope he, he keeps sleeping for the next <laughs> one hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, if not, that's okay. We'll deal with it. <laughs> yeah, it might be some some noises in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> so how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm really excited. I'm about to um, go to the JSS program in Italy again. So I'm, I'm leaving on Sunday. So are you teaching there or? I'm going as a student. I'm going as there. A as a student? My, yes. As, it's my... I'm taking six weeks to do nothing but paint, and I'm very excited about it. I, I saw some, some of your recent paintings on Instagram, and I was really impressed. The glacier paintings. Oh, and thank you. The portrait. Yeah, it was really good. Thank you. I especially like the brushwork on your portrait. I need to do more of those. I, I used to love 
love doing them and I haven't been doing them recently. And when I, I was going back through and looking at, well, just realizing how much work that I, I have that I have never posted. So I thought, okay, I'll start posting this. And most of those came from this project called A Portrait of Argentina. So looking back at the portraits, I was just like, oh, I miss them. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to have a show of those those works? I mean, portraits of Argentina. Are you going to have a show of them? Yeah, I did a show with them. That project, I did it in 20... I started it, I should say, in 2012. And then when I came back to the U.S., I did I did a, a show with them, which was like 2015. So yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> it's always amazing to see everything come together because it was about two years worth of work and to see it all kind of dressed up and in its finest and, and displayed was amazing. It's a really neat experience. What inspired you to do that? Well, I moved to Argentina because I was dating a gentleman from Argentina. So when I went down there, I thought, well, I'll just be there for six months or something. And I ended up staying, getting married, and <laughs> and, li- and living there for, for six years. And so once when we got married, I decided that I needed a big project. So I did a Kickstarter campaign and I did a portrait of Argentina as a way to both have a, a big painting project, which I, I felt like I needed, <laughs> and also to get to know the country because I felt like at that point I had been there for two years and I was really only experiencing sort of the immediate area. Uh-huh. And it just felt like such a waste to go live in another country and not really get to know it. So that's how I came up with A Portrait of Argentina. That's so good. You know, in my country, most of the people uh, just uh, know that uh, Argentina is very successful in football. Mm-hmm. And most people just know Lionel Messi. Mm-hmm. He's from Argentina. That's all. You know, <laughs> so, so works like these to show another aspect of a country like Argentina is really very valuable if if you can show it to all the people around the world, in every country, I mean. Because we, some people usually have these stereotypes of countries, and we do not get to see the other aspects of a country like Argentina. Mm-hmm. So I think projects like these are really worthwhile. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think... I think you're right that if you had to take the world population and poll them about Argentina, they would Messi would be at the top of what yeah. they mentioned. And the other thing that that people know is wine, beef, and tango. And <laughs> tango, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And the the interesting thing was that you know talking about that topic before I I went down there, I have a. My friend's husband was learning how to dance the tango, and so he's very, very, was very much into into tango, and that's what he knows about Argentina as well. And so he told me, he's like, "You must learn how to dance the tango because you're going to Argentina. How could you not dance the tango and go to this country?" And it turns out the only place they really the tango really is the dance of Buenos Aires, the capital. So it's one city out of this gigantic country, and everywhere else, they have no idea how to dance the tango and are not interested really? in learning. <laughs> <laughs> because they have their own cultural dances that come from their particular area, which are really, really interesting to see. You mean they've got different kinds of dances mm-hmm. other than tango? Yes. Yes. So, good yeah, variety of dancing styles. Yeah. This country. Yes. And, well, we have it in the, in the United States as well, the different accents from, depending on where you are. Uh-huh. Although I felt like in Argentina, it was much more pronounced. Not only is it much more pronounced, but they also have different vocabulary. What about painting? Do they have any special trends in, in painting in Argentina? Or is it like a, a, every other country? I wouldn't say that I saw anything in terms of technique that is extraordinarily different from other countries. I think subject matter though I would say is is different because of the history and the and the culture. You know, the reason I'm asking this question is because in my country we've got two major trends of, of painting. 
One is the painting that you, you might have in the U.S. I mean, there is realistic uh, traditional painting. And we also have uh, more abstract modern artists who, who do everything from cubism to, to, I don't know, abstract and all kinds of new styles. But apart from that, we also have Iranian painting or miniature. We can say we have got three major trends of painting in Iran. It's modern, traditional, and Iranian miniature. How would you describe Iranian miniature? Well, Iranian miniature is, it has got a long history. You know, it goes back to the 10th century. And it was mainly illustration for, for Persian poetry books. So it's very small in size. And it's mostly floral. And there, there are is depictions of lovers and gardens, but, but everything is so idealistic. You know, a garden is actually a paradise and the forms are sort of abstract. You know, there are so many shapes that look like, uh, for example, leaves and flowers and foliage, but they are very geometric, very general forms. And the other characteristic is the detail. You know, there is so much ex- exquisite detail in Iranian miniature. And in some era, it was under the influence of the Chinese painting. You know, the Mughals attacked Iran and they brought the Chinese traditional part into Iran. Indian, Chinese, and it's a combination of all these influences. Right. Interesting. Yeah, but, but currently, you know... We can say originally Iranian painting doesn't have perspective. Uh huh. That's what makes it so different from Western traditions. There's no perspective as you know. I mean, figures might be on top of each other. There is usually a building, but the building doesn't have any perspective. It's only a wall and some figures within some garden. And there is no anatomy as, as the Western art has, you know. All the figures have got some fixed shape, you know. For example, the faces are mostly in three quarters. Mm-hmm. The horses are all in the profile, so like that. But the colors are so diverse. Very bright colors? Yes, very bright colors, very diverse. Why do you think it, it is that way? Well, I think one reason is that, you know, in Iranian art, there is a preference for color over form. That's what I perceive. So we can say most of them are actually colorists. Those artists, they play with all kinds of colors. And the more the color, the the, the higher it is valued. And the other reason is that these paintings are very small size. They, they are actually put in, in small size books. So maybe that's another reason they couldn't work very much on anatomy perspective. And the other reason I think is, is the, their attitude toward the world. You know, it is uh, idealistic, spiritual. It is not supposed to depict the reality as they see it. Everything is symbolic. A tree is symbolic. I think that's why. Interesting. But now there are there are some some new generation of miniature painters in Iran who are working on new subject matter. For example, they depict daily life or modern poetry in Iran, and they have somehow incorporated a little bit of anatomy and a little bit of perspective. Yeah, trying to somehow modernize Iranian painting. Interesting. I love this. This is going to be a very interesting conversation. There is a very famous Iranian miniaturist. I think he's world-renowned, Farsh Chian, who is probably the most renowned painter of Iran at the time. He does miniature, and his works are, are really highly esteemed. Can you spell his name? Yeah, Farsh, F-A-R-C-H-I-A-N, Iranian miniature painter. 
How do you pronounce and pronounce his name again? I think I'll say it wrong. Farsh Shion. Farsh Shion, like that. Farsh, yeah, Farsh actually in, in Persian means uh, rug, carpet, and he's he actually comes from that tradition of carpet making in Islam. Aha, uh-huh. interesting. Okay, so I just pulled up some of his artwork. Yeah, so colorful because I've just previously was looking at just miniature Iranian mini- miniature art and then yeah got to see some of that and then i'm now looking at his in particular and yeah it's very reminds me of fairy tales almost yeah just with the design and the so much movement in there and all the bright bright colors yeah he he has you know transformed miniature but within some limits you know he's still keeping the general theme of uh, iranian painting and, and, you know, actually, I went to the fine art school in Isfahan. And this is uh, the school where Faxian also studied. And he was also a teacher there. D- so did you study with him? I think we're kind of going into the interview already. I haven't introduced yeah, you, but yeah. I'll just use it. Yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's good. Just, it's, it's the good immediate thing. fascination level. Whenever anyone starts telling <laughs> me about art in a different culture or a different culture, I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we. I, I went to fine art school of Isfahan, and you know, Isfahan is a very old city, right in the middle of Iran. And I come from there. I was born in Isfahan, and I went to fine art school there. Now I'm living in Tehran, but I think I come from that tradition of these Isfahani painters. One group focused at the time on an Iranian nature, and uh, the other group focused on watercolor painting. These are two major traditions of painting in Isfahan at that time. I went to Isfahan Fine Art School in the mid 1990s, mm-hmm. 1993 to 1996. And I saw some of his paintings, some of his miniature works in the gallery. And I was really impressed at the time. I had never seen Fakshian's paintings up close. And it was the first time I saw them. It was really amazing to see all these up close sketches. I imagine. What are those in general, and if he's different, but I'm curious about um, these miniature paintings. What, what are they painted with? Are they oil? No, actually, they are painted in gouache. Wow. Painted on gouache and round brushes are used and paper, painted on paper. Wow, that's incredible. And the the miniatures in general, what size are they? Like the size of a a, note, uh, a book, you said, but... Yeah, most of them are actually supposed to be small paintings. But nowadays I see some miniatures go for larger sizes and they use broader brushes to just make some large pieces. Can you tell me in centimeters about what the size is? Yeah, yeah. They are 70 by 50 centimeter. Okay. Yeah, not larger. This is the largest usually. Most of them are smaller than that. I'm really curious, since you studied at this school and you had access to to this teacher that definitely comes from that background of the traditional Iranian miniatures... Why did you choose to tell me a little bit about your your education there and how you how you saw it and what made you decide to paint more kind of traditional Western style? It seems so that seems such a big broad way to put it, traditional Western style. So I'm kind of cringing as I'm saying it. I'm kind of like, I don't know if I like that. Yeah, I was looking for a word, but it's usually what they call academia representational, mm-hmm. but, but the style taught in the fine art school at the time was taken from the French academia. It was the French style. So we did drawing for one year, and the second year we had to major in either miniature or uh, what we called nature painting. It was actually this thing we call Western style painting. 
I think I would, I would call it, uh, and, and I, I'm so always so, I don't know. I never, I don't like to put label, <laughs> to put labels on things because I feel like it's so restrictive, but, it, but it's representational art. You're painting objects so that they look like those objects and you're constructing these paintings with the idea that they are more or less based off of reality. Yeah, that was the main idea. Yeah, that was the education was based on realistic art. Mm-hmm. representation mm-hmm. and we did anatomy perspective and a lot of drawing getting proportions right and everything but the, at, at, even at that time there were teachers in Isfahan who didn't approve of this kind of training they were more modern style painters and you know Iran has also a very strong let's say now we can call it tradition of modern art you know Maybe 70, 80 years old. There are so many prominent modern Iranian painters. Maybe 10 years after Picasso, there were Iranian painters doing the same style. There have been some painters going to Europe, studying even with Picasso and other painters, and then coming back to Iran and doing similar modern style styles of painting. So there's a strong tradition there. At that time, when I went to fine art school, there were two camps, you know, one camp were representational. That's how I I learned painting. And there were some teachers who didn't support that and who said, you know, this is crazy. Why why do you spend hours painting like that? You can you can do modern art. And some students just, you know, fell for it and they they decided to do modern, but I, I stayed with the traditional style. What was it that attracted you to it? This is a very hard question to answer, but it was so natural that I I never thought twice about it. I thought it's the only way that can satisfy me because I'm very much interested in nature. And I think art is supposed to, to help me get closer to nature. And if it doesn't do that, there is no reason I should do art. So I think... Art is outside there in the work. You know, it's a reflection of that at least. So, if I just make things up in my own mind, and which is quite irrelevant to the nature, to the world outside, then there is no reason I should do it. This is how I have always thought about it. That's really interesting, and I'm wondering if it is a cultural or a personal thing. But I hear a lot of artists especially from the United States, who see art as a personal reflection, as a form of communication, as a way to express themselves. And what you're describing sounds less about you and more about the environment, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I think it does. It makes perfect sense. You know, I think my art is more about the environment than me. That's what I think of myself. And I think if I can make art that is not just about me, then it is easier for other people to understand it. If it is too personal, then I think I might make some really amazing pictures, but the question is how many people can really relate to it. So I I think the common ground here between the artist and the audience is nature. And this has a long tradition in Iranian art. You know, Iranian art has always been about nature, but in its own way. So an artist like me, learning the Western style of painting, I think learns all those techniques to then say something about nature. Again. So in, in terms of content, I'm, I'm trying to, to stick with my own tradition that it lies in nature, in my attitude toward nature, but in using techniques that are not actually coming from my own culture. They are Western stuff. But why shouldn't we use them? You know, in Iran, there is a discussion now that we should go back to miniature painting and we should discard the Western style because it is not ours. But I, I totally disagree with that. I think Western art, the traditional style, is the best way to teach art. So, I mean, how can you teach art through modern techniques? Can you do that? I mean, can you teach art simply using the modern style? Is it possible? 
How, okay, and how would you des describe the modern style? Are you referring to abstract sort of expressionist style art? From cubism to, to action expressionism, you know, all mm -hmm. these new trends. I don't reject them, you know, I actually enjoy modern art. You know, there is a museum in Tehran, contemporary museum of art, and there are so many great modern works of art from, from Aschenberg to Pala. Many other modern painters are represented in this museum, and I go there and see them, and I enjoy them. But, but I don't think we can use this kind of technique in order to teach art. Right. Well, I also come from a background where I was taught representationally. So where I went to school, it was very much, I think the first three years, we basically just drew the figure and then slowly learned how to use color and how, how to paint. So I don't have the experience of coming from the background where modern art is taught, but from the interviews that I've done, what I've noticed is in the United States, at least there was a period of time where that's what they, they taught was modern art and modern art, meaning all of those, those movements and representational art wasn't something it was rejected and people didn't want to teach it. And so there's this, there's sort of whole generation of people who went to school during that time. And very often what I'll hear from them is that they didn't learn anything in, in school. Yeah. You know, I, I think we had the same kind of thing in Iran, especially in the university, universities of art in Iran. They thought that they could just jump into modern art. Some other people believe that uh, traditional style is prerequisite. You have mm -hmm. to first learn how to paint stuff like it, stuff, to look like stuff, and then you can do modern art. But others uh, believe that, no, you, you can just jump into modern stuff. Why should you, you know, worry about, I don't know, everything from perspective, anatomy, proportions, colors, everything. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. just paint more freely. I don't know. It's a big topic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very controversial. Yes. Everywhere. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I was, I recently interviewed somebody who, it was an interesting conversation, but I was talking to Mario Navis, who's an abstract painter, and we had a similar conversation and he was taught representational art and eventually moved into abstract art. But when... I brought up that topic of, I don't feel like it was an interesting conversation because I don't feel like I have enough knowledge about abstract art to be able to, to solidly articulate why some is good and why some is not, or why some is perceived as, as, as good and some isn't, or even why I really respond from the heart to some abstract art. And there's others where I just don't even... <laughs> Like I, I glance at it for two, about two seconds to maybe acknowledge that it's there, but it doesn't hold my attention. I'm not interested in it and I'm, you know, walking away from it that quickly. So it's, it's a really interesting experience to have that I, you know, I kind of freely admit, I don't feel like I know very much at all about abstract art, even though I've had a pretty solid education. And I know I would say more about that than your average person. But it was the conversation that we had was about why is it that, you know, what, how, how do you determine abstract art? What's, what's good and what's not? And why is it so difficult to talk about? Well, because it's abstract. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> really, it's, it is complicated. Yeah, but, but I think, I don't know, this, this may sound a bit crazy, but I think all art is, is abstract in some way. All art, even realistic art yeah. is abstract. I agree. I see it that way. You know, I, when I do realistic paintings, I am also thinking abstract. And uh, I see some degree of... So I, I think it's all about the degree of abstraction that you have. You know, there is a spectrum of, of uh, abstraction that you can make use of in your painting. For me, I am now moving more towards the abstract and I am trying to incorporate more abstract elements in my recent paintings, especially for the backgrounds. I used to just have, I don't know, some blending colors in the background of my figures. 
But now I am working on some shapes that are not very discernible shapes. So you can call it abstract, can't you? There are some shapes in the background that are somehow not clearly recognizable, but you may, if you look carefully, you may recognize that you know, some, some car in the background or parts of a tree, but you don't know exactly what it is. So I think I, as a painter who has a long tradition in, in representation of painting, have this freedom to also use abstraction. Mm hmm. And that's I mean, that's the thing that I think is so interesting about that conversation about learning representational art and then moving into abstract art and whether or not that makes you a better abstract artist. I think that you have, even though what you're painting is abstract, I kind of feel like there is, you know, that that's the thing that I'm not really able to articulate when I look at abstract art is that the ones that I really respond to when I dig deeper into that artist, they have a background in representational art, and yet there is nothing in that painting that you can say that is that particular object. It's just something, It's an. It's, this is more of an observation and, and me struggling to... Yeah, like, I, I think it's also a little bit controlled. You know, in my country, if you want to be taken seriously, you have to have some experience in representational art, prove yourself first, and then if you do abstract, you will be taken more seriously. Mm. But if you just do abstract from the very beginning, I, I don't think very many people will take it seriously. That's interesting. I have a couple of questions <laughs> for you from yeah. like, just picking up on things that we've been we've been talking about. Um, I just wanted to like follow that conversation. You you mentioned that your art is a response to nature. And this may be just my individual interpretation <laughs> of nature, but your your paintings are figurative, like at least the ones that I've seen are figurative and they are more, I guess I would describe them as, as urban paintings. Yes. Can you elaborate a little bit on that, on your subject matter and, and why you choose it? Yeah, you know, the subjects I choose come from a wide range of elements. I have always been interested in figurative art. A couple of years ago, I started doing these small size paintings of cityscapes. So it made me go out into the city and take pictures. I, I took all, lots of pictures and then I did drawings of them and then I, I moved shapes around and came up with, with better compositions and then I turned them into color studies, color sketches. And I made some collection of these uh, cityscapes. And then I, I thought of incorporating figures into my painting. So I thought it's better I paint people as they live their lives in the city. So I went for, I don't know, city workers, municipality workers with those uniforms, most of them these bright yellow colors or bright green colors wearing a uh, uniform. And I really like that, that color in, in the city. You know, they give some livelihood to, to the boring city in which we live. So it's not just the walls. I mean, there are people wearing these uniforms and it was interesting for me. So I, I painted some of them. And there is one painting that is actually seen from the top. It has a cabinet, if I remember right. Does it have a cab, a taxi? Yeah, there's a cabinet. And I, I, I actually painted that from the top of a tower. What interested me was uh, these geometric shapes that were created when uh, there was a long shadow cast over the zebra crossings. And there was, I don't know, a lot of shapes you know, coming together. And it was very inspiring for me. When I saw it, I, I decided to, to, to paint that. But when I, this is interesting, when I wanted to enter a festival in Iran, which is actually the most important festival of art in Iran, it's called Faj Festival. I entered the show and this painting was shortlisted and it was shown in the museum. And when I, the, the day when I wanted to hand the painting in, you know, the person in charge told me that it's a very interesting painting. I said, why is it interesting? Why did you find it interesting? 
And he said, it's because there are two people in the painting trying to cross the street, but they are not on the zebra crossing. <laughs> yeah. I noticed that right away too. And I, I was thinking, yeah. I was thinking that looks very much like, like how people walk in Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he, he actually, that was how he, he saw the painting. Oh, that's but, so funny. You know, I, I, I never thought about that when I was painting it. But, but it's interesting how differently people react to, to your painting. You know? Yes. It never crossed my mind that I'm actually sending some kind of traffic message to people. <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> I could have done an illustration. Why should I have painted and I was thinking just uh, about shadows and light and geometry and shapes. But then, you know, this is the response you get. Yes. And that's good. Well, I mean, as a as a painting, when I so when I first glanced at it, I think, you know, you have that initial response. And the patterns, the shadows of, you know, it's like late in the afternoon or early in the morning, you have those very long shadows. And that was the first thing I noticed, I think. Yeah. Or it, or it might have been the yellow. And see, of course, I assume it's a taxi, but there's nothing on there that says it's a taxi. I just assume because it's yellow, it's a taxi. Yeah, it's a yellow cat. <laughs> yeah. And then I noticed the people. But I think, I think it's a human thing to want to put things in order. And so you kind of want to put them in the crosswalk. Like you have this... <laughs> And then you yeah. start thinking about all these other things, right? Because you have one person who's just outside of the outside of it, and then somebody who's just right down the middle of the street. So like, as an artist, I look at it and I see shapes and I see that these, you know, there's actually three people in there, at least that I that I notice right away, just one is in shadow, and they're leading me in and pulling me out and, you know, kind of doing this, actually very similar to what I was I was noticing in the work of the miniature artist whose name I've already forgotten, so I apologize. <laughs> Farshian. Farshian. I will get it probably by the time we're done yeah. speaking, I hope. Farsh. Farsh's carpet, yeah. Farsh's carpet. Farshian. Chian. But it has that sort of, I'm making a motion with my hand, which is not helpful at all to people who are listening to the podcast. It's like the this ribbon curve. Yeah, you know, actually, I kept so many angles, sharp angles in that painting. But in miniature painting, it's, as you said, mostly curves. We don't have angles in, in Iranian miniature. It's mostly curves. And curves are beautiful. Yes. You know, in Iranian painting, angles are not very beautiful. The curves are. And level of mastery of a miniaturist is actually how beautifully they can create curves. Mm. The more beautiful curves, the more masterful it is. Interesting. I like it. Now this fashion, if you look up his drawings, you see he, he makes all these sweeping, curving, long lines in just one move, in one sweep. And that's his mastery. That is so interesting to me. And I think that is also coming from Chinese tradition of mm -hmm. brush painting. I'm scrolling through your, I'm looking through your paintings now. I keep stopping on this, this one of the, the worker who's, it looks like there's a shoot coming down, but he's, he's in, looks like a municipal, I would guess it's a municipality worker. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Which one is it? The one in profile? Yes. He's in profile and it's relatively close up and he looks like he's, I'm imagining that it's uh well he's 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 it looks like he's kind of inside of of something and there's a chute coming down and and he's holding yeah. maybe a shingle or something. It is working. Yeah, you know and, yeah. and this is actually called work series. I was working on the concept of work and how work can can affect people. Because when I see people working I, I see some kind of beauty in their face, you know, some kind of concentration mm -hmm. that it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. when, especially these people doing manual work, you know, th their faces are somehow, you know, dust covered and th there is sweat coming down. And, and, and this is what I like about these subjects. 
But but that's not all, you know. In, in a painting like that, I I was trying to experiment with abstraction and realism. Yes. See how far I can push with abstraction, but giving minimum inf- information about a subject and what he's doing. That was my major goal. Yeah. I think you pulled it off. It's really, it's, that's, I just keep looking and I think it's, <laughs> and I think it's because of the, you know, that abstraction and then also the dynamicism of all of the shapes. Oh uh, yeah. All of the shapes and, and this, it's interesting because it, you keep looking at, you kind of know what it is, but you kind of like, I, I want to almost pull back from it and really see what's ha- what's happening in there because I can't say what that thing is except for the shoot, but I kind of like have a good idea of what he's doing just because I've also spent a lot of time looking at construction. <laughs> <laughs> and there, this painting has got an interesting story. You know, I showed it in my solo show last year and it was one of the paintings that sold, but the person buying it was a very close friend of mine and he is, you know, a person that I didn't expect to buy such a painting. You know, he's not interested in painting at all. And he, he is into, I don't know, rock music, girls, I don't know, stuff like that. So one day he came to the gallery and he just said that I have come here not for the painting, just come, come here to see some girls. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then. Very <laughs> honest. <laughs> Yeah, he, he, he was uh, walking around and then I saw him glued to this painting. And I said, what is it? He, he said, I can't take my eyes off this. I said, come on, you, you don't like this, something like that. He said, yeah, I like it and I want to buy it. And he, he got it and he hangs in his living room now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's so many things I love about that story. <laughs> But first of all, you know, I think what I love most is that somebody who's, you know, professedly not interested in art buys the piece. And yeah, it's a really very, very lovely story. I like it. Can you tell me a little bit about how you work? What is your studio like? What do you do when you when you go into when you start painting? I like the word you usually use in your interviews, and that's ritual. Yes. Tell me about your ritual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like it. My ritual. I I usually wash my face. I don't know why. Wash my face and my hands. Then I, I usually start with drawing on a piece of paper. Not specifically about that subject. It's my way of just warming up. Gives me more confidence. You know, lets my arms loose and I... I feel like uh, painting. When I draw more, I feel like I can paint more confidently. And then, yeah, starting the painting, I sometimes directly put some paint. It might be the darkest dark. And then I push them around, see what shapes are forming. And if I like something, I keep working on it. If I don't, I wipe it off, work again. This is the fun part and the difficult part as well, you know, because sometimes it doesn't lead anywhere. You, you've spent the whole day and the evening, you're, you haven't just made any, any pictures, any progress. You have to start all over again. This is my studio ritual, but when I paint out in the open air, I usually do a black and white study to, to get the values and then uh, I, I do the painting. And you do that in, in oils or are you working in acrylics? Yes, I just work in oils. So you must paint really light at first and then go in and work the color? Yeah, yeah. I'm tentative at first. Then if I find something nice is taking shape, then I get excited, tweak it a little bit, work on it. I count a lot on serendipity. Can I use that word? Yes, you can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have my permission. <laughs> <laughs> You're a native. Yeah, serendipity. I like that word. Yeah, to see what comes up. Yeah. Uh, and I make lots of mistakes. I, I think of every painting. This might sound good, like a cliche, but, but 
ever painting for me is some kind of example. If I learn something, yeah, then I think of it as success. Success painting. That is such a great mindset to have. It's my favorite. That you know, because what it what I what I hear when you say that is that it's about the experience and it's about learning above all else. And I think I'm at the risk of being preachy, but <laughs> I think that that's... It is so right. Yeah, it is so right. Yeah. Like, so many people keep saying that, but it doesn't make it wrong. It is, it is so right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because it, you have such... Inf- when you look at your painting and your life that way, it becomes infinite. And I think it's a beautiful thing, an infinite in a good way. There's no end to it. There's no end to what you can learn as a painter, and there's no end to what you can learn as a human being. But, you know, I, I have noticed that some painters paint consistently well. You know, all the products they make are so good and so similar to one another. I don't know how they do it. I don't want to make a value judgment on this. But I don't think I can, I can paint like that. You no, know, If I paint a uh, two, three paintings, and they come out the same way, I think something must be wrong. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, when I see people who whose paintings consistently come out well, as you're describing, and I'm, I'm making the assumption that I'm seeing them either through social media or, or at a gallery, I'm usually assuming that those are the ones they're choosing to show and that they're not showing the mistakes. Uh-huh. Showing and selling. Yes, that there's a there's a different, you know, that they may have plenty of mistakes. They're just... But they don't show it. Right, right. Which, of course, in a gallery se- setting, you want to curate your work. You don't want to show the bad stuff. So maybe we should do that, too. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should start doing that, too. Yeah, what? Twice. I've never painted a bad painting. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I think, you know, I mean, and that's another very contentious subject. It's when it comes to social media, there are some people that are absolutely in the camp of the work should be curated and I only show finished pieces that I'm proud of. And then there's people like, you know, like me that (laughs) I go back and forth, admittedly, like I will go, I do go long periods without posting often, but I'll show the, you know, like I'll just be excited about working on a painting and be like, hey, this is what I'm working on. And and show it when it's just the super drippy first 10 or 12 brush lines. And then I might show it later, but I, I kind of, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I, if I, I should or not, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. There is also a danger. Sometimes I feel like I'm falling into the other extreme that is experimenting too much. You know, sometimes I, experiment with something, I push ahead with it, then I just drop it and start experimenting with something else. Mm-hmm. And I think this is not good either. You know, if, if you find some, some line that you think might lead somewhere, you should keep working on it until you, you get somewhere. I don't know. It's, it's a little bit complicated. Yes. Experimenting too much and not experimenting. I don't think you can experiment too much. That's my personal opinion. Really? Really. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, really. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you don't have to show them to everybody, but I don't think you can experiment too much. And so I- let me ask you a question. Mm-hmm. Andres, let me ask you a question. If you are experimenting with something, okay, and then you, you, you realize that you can push ahead with this particular technique, Okay. There is room for more practice on that particular line you're working on. So how far should you go into that line? I mean, that's the question. Before you drop it and go experimenting something else. I think that, honestly, I think that you, it is impossible to experiment and not take it with you. Whether you're conscious of it or not, it goes with you into the next painting. So in terms of where you should drop it, I think it's almost like asking, and this is not meant to be facetious, but it's almost like asking, when is the painting done? When is this experiment done? And for me, that means it's it's done when I've I've learned what I needed to from it. 
<laughs> so I think that, you know, I mean, I think experimenting within painting is, I mean, I, I highly, highly, highly encourage it because it's, it's freeing and it doesn't mean, for example, I could, you know, my work is, is representational and I could decide that I'm going to experiment with cubism for a while. I may not show that to everybody. I may take that as my, you know, my private learning lesson and play with it, but I'm can almost guarantee you that it will somehow, even if it's the most subtle flavor, show up in my next painting. And I think it's almost to further that analogy of, of flavor, it's almost like with cooking, you can learn to use different spices. And just because you've decided that you like this particular spice doesn't mean you're going to dump the whole jar in the next thing you cook. Mm, yeah. You might just use a little pinch of it. So once you, you take your lesson, you, you consider it done. Yeah, that's that's how I see it. And it's, it's it's also partly when your interest in it starts to die down. That's, I guess, another another signal. Although I would preface that by saying that we, as artists, I think it's important to be very aware of the difference between a legitimate reduction. <laughs> that sounds like such a big way to say it. But you're legitimately not interested in that exploration anymore versus you're just frustrated and irritated and don't want to do it anymore. Uh, to me, those are very different things. And so that frustration, I kind of feel like we should push through it. Yeah. But if it's a genuine disinterest, then move on. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's my personal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. We started this conversation with a little bit of a of a talk on some paintings that that I did that were in response to living to Argentina and you said something really interesting which was you made the observation that a lot of people don't know anything about Argentina outside of Messi the football yes. player or the soccer player or the football player to the to most of the world and to the soccer player too yes. <laughs> Say football. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so I want to ask you a question off of that. What do you think are the most common perceptions of Iran? And a follow up question that to that would be what what would you prefer people think about if it's not what they already think about? Well, I really don't know. I I hope it is positive. I hope people around the world think of my country. You know, as a positive nation, you know, the, the people have been a little bit cut off from the rest of the world for years. And now there are some better opportunities for tourists to come into Iran. And I hope people come to Iran, to more and more and more tourists come to Iran to, to see for themselves. You know, many people are very kind, very friendly, very hospitable. But you should come here and see it for yourself. Yeah, I hope it is positive. I don't know. And I think art can, can do a lot here. I think artists have, have this kind of mission to, to say something about their culture. Artists can do that. I think art, art can connect people in, in many ways. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Did it answer your question? <laughs> you did answer my question. It's <laughs> no, it's really interesting because especially in the United States, we have I think in general, I would say, and I'm trying to figure out how to say this without insulting everybody, but <laughs> but I think I can freely say it. I mean, my experience yes, has been course. been in general, people from the United States know very little about other countries and other cu cultures other than what they see on the news. And in the United States, what's on the news about Iran is our political relationship with Iran, which is very tumultuous. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best word you could use. <laughs> <laughs> and so I always see things like there's the governments are having their own little thing going on. And then there's there's human beings that are kind of caught up in the middle of it who most of the time don't really have anything to do with that. <laughs> Yes, of course. Yeah, it's so true. I think it's a very, I've been told by uh, my husband mostly, but by a lot of people that I'm overly optimistic and very Pollyanna-ish, which is, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that term, but it's the steadfast 
it comes from a character in a story, but it's basically, I will only see the good. <laughs> uh-huh. I w- that's what Polynesh means? Pollyanna, yes. Pollyanna? It, yeah, it comes from the name Pollyanna. And it's a it's a character who pretty much would only see the absolute good in everything and refuse to see anything bad. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so an extreme form of optimism. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, to be positive. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I was reading an, an article about positive psychology and how many people are now working on it, developing it. The, the psychology of love, the psychology of being positive, because, you know, for, for a long time, there was this tradition of Freudian negative psychology, with all the negativity that he you know, describes in people and everything is has some roots in our unconscious that is usually connected to some, something negative, including art, you know, for mm. example. It's, it's, the inner child that, that has been disturbed. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah because... I don't believe in that. I think people need to be Polynesh. What? what <laughs> Pollyanna. <laughs> <laughs> the name is Pollyanna. I yeah. don't know if Pollyanna-ish is a word, but it's it's like saying sort of Pollyanna. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah, but, but the situation is probably something like uh, the tension between Argentina and England. Yes. You know, there's similar tension between those two countries. But the people are just the people. Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, on that subject of positive psychology, and it's something that I'm very interested in also. And there's a theory called learned optimism, which is basically it's it's really interesting because you can you can see people as being just absolutely pessimistic in the sense that when they go out into the world, they see what's wrong with it. So the the stereotypical definition of an optimist versus pessimist would be that the optimist goes goes out and he sees only the good in the world, and the pessimist goes out and sees only the bad, and both of them are sort of, in some ways, ignoring the other side. And I think what's more accurate is being optimistic and looking for and seeing the good, and still recognizing that there's there's bad things out there, <laughs> you know? You mean to be realistic? Yeah, 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 it's to be it's to be realistic. But it's also a conscious choice I think to see and experience what's what's good because I think when you focus on something it's what you find, right? As an artist, if you're really interested in co- in color for example, when you go outside you just you've trained yourself to see color everywhere in all the clouds and in, in the fog, you know, anywhere where people traditionally don't think of as being very colorful. And I think that your mindset and optimism, pessimism can be that same way that if you train yourself to look for what's bad, and this is why I sort of feel sorry for for police officers, because their job is to anticipate and look for everything that could go wrong. And I think that it affects their personality. Yeah, and I think you said it so beautifully, and I see it like art can help us better focus on that positive aspect of the world. Yeah. Because art, by nature, is uh, directing your eyes towards the beauty, and uh, the beauty in nature. So it, it, it actually makes you more positive. There is no other option, you know. When when you see, when you do art, you you are drawn to to nature, to beauty. Wherever you go, you find beauty. So, what thing better than art can can help us be more positive? I think one reason why I do art is because of it's because it, it helps me see the positive aspect. I like that. Exactly. I, I so agree with what you said. Beautiful. And on that note. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, is that glacier painting in the on the wall behind your back? Is it a glacier painting? It is the one that I'm currently working on, yes. Uh, you're working on it, yeah? Yeah. yeah I, I saw it on Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> it's a really good thing. Thank you. I appreciate that. I want to sort of give you the last the last word in this conversation. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you would 
like to say to other artists who are listening to this show? You know, we need to, we, by we, I mean all the people. I, I don't just mean the artists. I mean, everybody needs to rethink their ideas about art. And I think art has been a bit sidetracked in our society. You know, there are many issues involved in all this crazy hunger for money, globalization, lots of things happening. And art has been a bit sidetracked. And we will pay the price, you know, if art is sort of, I don't know, omitted from our lives, then what is left? So I, I, I just hope that people... There was a beautiful sentence somebody said on your podcast. I don't know who said that. But he said very beautifully that some people need to do math so some other people can have the food to do art. And uh, these people should, should accept both the math and the art as really important aspect of our lives. So I, I hope art thrives. That's all. Yeah. I hope we will have more artists and Better artists, not just more, the quantity is not the matter, it's better artists. I think we need more honest art. You know, we need more honesty in art. That's what I mean by better artists. I don't mean just technique. I mean, we need better, more honest artists because, you know, with all these recent developments in art, we come up with so many phony artists. And people who do not belong in art, but they, they are you know, taking all the space and they are everywhere. I, I don't know. And I'm not talking modern, traditional. I, no, no, no. I, I think in every style, in every technique, if you're honest, then your art can, can reach people. You know, one example is David Hockney. You know, he, he has a painting, Mr. and Mrs. Clark's. I'm sure you've seen that painting. It's a couple in a living room. And the man, Mr. Clark, has his foot in the rock. And when they asked him, why did you put the foot in the rock? And they were expecting some kind of philosophical answer. And he, he, David Hawkins said, it's because I couldn't paint the foot. So I just, <laughs> I just put it in the rock. <laughs> I, I think that honesty is valuable. And, and I really love his paintings. You know, I never do a painting like that, but I really like his paintings. <laughs> yeah, and I think honesty is great. Just be honest. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I know I was about to end the conversation, but I'm curious, though, having just heard you say that, you also mentioned earlier that we talked about your art being a way for you to get, to bring nature in, to get closer to nature and that I'm paraphrasing and if I've misunderstood, then I would, I want to be corrected. But what I think you said was that you felt like your personality shouldn't be too much in your art. Yeah. And so I'm curious how that balances with what you just said. So I'd love to hear you elaborate on that. Or if I heard you wrong, please correct me. No, I, I said that I want my art not to be just about me. I want my art to be about the world outside me, not just for the audience to relate better to my art, but also for myself. Because I see art as a way to just connect me to the world outside me, to the nature, to, to other people as well. Mm -hmm. As I said, I think art at best directs our eyes towards beauty. So if I just find beauty inside myself, so what's the point? Right. Then you're the artistic equivalent of the never-ending selfie. Yeah. <laughs> I might be, I don't know, I, I might be a good subject for another artist if they capture, I don't know, me in nature or somewhere among other people and they think, okay, this figure is good to paint. This person has got a look on his face. It's painting it. That may work, but for me, just, you know, painting my own world, I don't know. I, I have never felt like it's the right thing to do. 
Well, I think there's a universality that that needs to be in in the work for people to understand it. It's it's like with there's this kind of balance between familiar and unfamiliar. And I think that the familiar is nature or the familiar is this world that's around you and there are certain constructs within that that people understand. But I think for me, what the what the artist adds to it is their own view of that. And their view is shown in what they're choosing to paint, how they're choosing to paint it. And that's where the authenticity comes from is when the artist does put a little bit more of themselves into it. And that can be super, super subtle. It doesn't have to be, you know, like, jumping up and down and screaming and saying, hi, I'm here and everybody look at me. But I think what makes individual artists stand out is their willingness to be a little bit vulnerable in their painting and to and to show that. And it's so difficult to say precisely what that is. But I think we kind of know it when we see it. I I know what you mean. This is another aspect of Western ideology. There is a lot of emphasis on individuality. And it's very important for every person to to be individualistic, especially if they are artists, right? In my culture, you know, there is not that much emphasis on individuality. You can be a great artist, but you do not have to have your own style. There is no obligation that you, you have to develop a unique style. I don't think there are any unique styles that are left to be developed, to be quite honest. <laughs> really? I, I exactly think so, yeah. How many styles can we have? But it, but it's interesting, you know, a lot of styles have been developed by other, other artists. But even now, you, you see some, some artists do art, very simple, very representational. And it's like their fingerprint. You know, it is so unique. I don't know. It, I might get there someday, you know, find a very unique style of my own. I don't know if I find that so good but if not i am not going to just artificially you know try to make something very different right to just claim that it's mine it's my style yeah but if it happens it's so good and it may happen you know i may do a very (laughs) unique way of painting i don't know (laughs) but i'm not going to kill myself for that no (laughs) <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> yeah. Isan, do I, am I pronouncing your name right? Because usually yes. when I do these interviews, I have a little chat beforehand and I make sure, but we just rolled right into it, which is wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I love it. But I never made sure that I knew how to pronounce your name. So it's Isan? Yes, Isan, which means uh, kindness. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and what is your name? It is... <laughs> <laughs> Very funny after that conversation about individuality and the difference in cultures. It was my mom's best friend in college was named Anne Therese, and it's a combination of Anna Teresa. So it's, oh. um, <laughs> it was, uh, I'm the youngest of six children. And by the time my mom had me, she was, she was tired of the, of the normal names and <laughs> wanted something unusual. Oh so. Yeah. So is it a unique name? It is. Yes. Yeah, because I have never heard. Most most people haven't. And so yeah, it's a, it's yeah. A, it was very difficult in Argentina because they were looking for where, how do you where where does this where's the genesis of this so that we can translate ah. it and there's none. <laughs> Ana Teresa. Ana Teresa would be the closest. Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Isan, it has been an absolute delight to talk with you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Thank you for having me. It was great pleasure. Very nice talking to you. Absolutely. And did I hear your son just woke up? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That's Isan. (laughs) Is is his name Isan as well? No, his name is actually Sam Yon. Sam? Yes. You know Sam? Uh Uh-huh. American name? We say Sam. Sam. Sam Yon. And Sam is actually, uh, let's say, a legendary figure coming from Iranian history. And Yar means friend. So it's friend of Sam. Beautiful. Well, thank you again. Thank you. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Isan as much as I did. You definitely want to go to the show notes for this episode and check out Asan's work. You can also see links to connect with Asan as well as links to all of the other artists that we talked about and some of the art movements that we mentioned. All those resources are there for you in the show notes at SavvyPainter.com. Now I have a very exciting announcement to make. Savvy Painter, Gamblin Artist Colors, and Trakel Art Supplies are teaming up together to do our very first juried art show. Artist Carol Marine will be jurying the show. You might remember Carol was a guest on The Savvy Painter. She is a painter herself and the founder of DailyPaintWorks.com. First place winner will receive $500 in merchandise from both Gamblin and Trakel, plus a cash prize of $250. But that's not all. The first place winner will also be my guest on the Savvy Painter podcast. So if you win first prize, you get your work in front of tens of thousands of people, $1,000 worth of art supplies to paint to your heart's content, and some cold hard cash. Not too shabby, huh? Second and third place winners get gift cards from Gamblin and Chakel as well, plus a quick mini interview on the podcast. You can submit your work at onlinejuriedshows.com. Entries are being accepted from now until October 29th. You can also click the link on SavvyPainter.com, and I can't wait to see the great work that you submit. So again, you have from now until October 29th, 2017 to submit your work. Good luck! One more thing I want to let you know, this year you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. The workshop, How to Develop a Relationship with the Right Gallery, helped several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop. So you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists pushed through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. And you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no, I'm putting air quotes there, she had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned, but more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>